Welcome back for another episode of the Ross Bolin Podcast. I am Ross Bolin here with your co-host Jared Borslow, otherwise known as J-Bone. What's good, Pimpin? I have other nicknames, too. Other nicknames? Yeah. Would you Would you care to share them? The Mechanical Squirrel. Oh, yeah. How could we forget that one? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any others? Uh, Long Dong Silver? Silver. Like yeah. that. That's your pirate name? Yep. Well... It's good for me to know since we're in a maid to Jared, yesterday was a holiday of sorts for stoners, 420 as it is known, and we didn't record because I was having what is known as a mental health day, but uh, since you and I are in a state where marijuana is still illegal and in a country where pot prohibition is still federally fucking us, it only feels right that we kick today's show off with a tale of organized marijuana crime. Let's ride. <laughs> Grab your light, this is Stop the Wikipedia, when you high. Stop the Wikipedia, when you're high. I heard Cade cough out there while the music was playing. Do you think he's hitting a bong? It's possible. It's entirely possible. Today's Stuff to Wikipedia, when you're high, is the Cornbread Mafia. The Cornbread Mafia was the name for a group of Kentucky men who created the largest domestic marijuana production operation in United States history. It was based in Marion, Nelson, and Washington counties in central Kentucky, and the term Cornbread Mafia was first used in public by federal prosecutors in June 1989, where they revealed that 70 men had been arrested in a press conference. Uh, This was announced that they uh, arrested 70 men for organizing a marijuana trafficking ring that stretched across 30 farms in 10 states, stretching from the southeast into the Midwest. Between 1985 and 1989, 70 Kentuckians were accused of growing 182 tons of marijuana on 29 farms in 10 states, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Missouri, and Kansas included, which federal prosecutors considered to be the, quote, largest domestic marijuana producing organization in the nation. See, the thing I can't get over is that Cornbread Mafia sounds like what Paula Dean would call her email list subscribers. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. That's good. By the end of 1991, prosecutors had arrested more than 100 members of the Cornbread Mafia, mostly from Lebanon, Kentucky, which I didn't know existed. The most notable member of the Cornbread Mafia was Johnny Boone. Isn't that just everybody's name in Kentucky? It's the whole organization's name, so who knows which one that is. It's like an I am Spartacus situation. (laughs) I'm Johnny Boone. I'm Johnny Boone. No, I'm Johnny Boone. Yeah. Uh, but but they what actually, a name. They're all Johnny Boone and they're all related. What a name. Johnny Boone. The, of course, the most notable member of the Cornbread Mafia's name is Johnny Boone. He was arrested in 1987, the year I was born, as the ringleader of a marijuana operation in Minnesota for which he served about 15 years in prison. In June 2008, police discovered Boone growing 2,421 marijuana seedlings on his farm outside Springfield, Kentucky, in Washington County. They counted each individual seedling to, yeah, they, to the one? They really get you. It's like when I got arrested for the first time and I had one loose cigarette in my pocket, <laughs> and despite charging me with possession of marijuana and uh, minor in possession of alcohol, they popped me for minor in possession of tobacco for the one loose freaking cigarette. Like, they get you for every seedling, Jared, when Couldn't they can. Couldn't you have said you picked it up because it was litter, and you were like, oh, I don't want to, I'm just a good Samaritan. Yeah, at this point, the guy wasn't hearing it, but, you know, I could have potentially tried to make that argument. Uh, but this guy escaped Boone, and uh, under the threat of life, a life sentence without parole, he escaped because the bust would have been his third federal conviction under the three strikes law. We all know how that goes. Boone became a fugitive and the subject of a segment on America's Most Wanted on December 22nd, 2016. After eight years on the run, Johnny Boone was arrested in a small town outside Montreal where he had been tracked by the U.S. Marshal Service. I feel like the three strikes policy is really dumb because it's after you you have two strikes down... You're just going to go out guns blazing because you're I mean, like, fuck, I'm going to l- prison for life. Getting another strike for sure at some point. They should call it the four strikes law and then just make it be actually three strikes like to trick people. So they're like, oh, I'm fine. I got another strike. And they're like, it's what, bitch? Yeah. Well, I mean, we know there are strikes, but are there balls is my question. Like three strikes, you're out. But four balls, do th- and, then, and then am I released from prison? It's a good question. Did COVID count as a ball? Because it got a lot of people out. Uh, Contrary to the life sentences he was facing, Boone was sentenced to 57 months by Chief District Court Judge Charles Simpson III and sentenced to serve his time in FCI 
Elkton, a low security federal prison in Ohio. Low in the, security? Yeah. And in the midst of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, the Elkton prison became notorious for being overrun with the disease. On April 8th, 2020, a former Louisville police officer, Brandon Wood, who was serving time there for his role in a child sex abuse scandal, asked a judge for release due to COVID-19. So Boone's attorneys made a similar request on May 21st, and he was granted release on June 3rd of 2020. President Barack Obama also granted clemency to three men from Marion County, Kentucky. All were either directly or indirectly connected to the Cornbread Mafia. In 2018, Bickett and Boone, two of the main guys from the Cornbread Mafia, founded a CBD company based in Marion County and became the first CBD company to produce hemp to make CBD CBD products grown by original members of the Cornbread Mafia. So these guys actually went from completely illegitimate Kentucky bootleg like marijuana operation to now present day legitimate businessmen, which is a very difficult transition to make, but they really did it. So there is hope for us yet at the Ross Boland podcast. We are obviously an organized crime gang. Um, so yeah, they start a CBD company. They, they not only sell CBD products, but also grow the hemp to make their products on their family farms near Raywick, Kentucky, which is primarily grown by original members of the cornbread mafia. Um, their CBD products are the only CBD products endorsed by the original members of the Cornbread Mafia, including Joe Keith Bickett and Johnny Boone. Joe Keith Bickett and Johnny Boone. Their products are sold nationwide. They've got a website, bickettandboone.com, and they pride themselves in producing a CBD product from, quote, seed to seal. Seed to seal is also what I call it when I jerk off onto a seal. That is the weed version of farm to table. Seed to seal. What's the seal? It's when they seal it up and... Ship, I don't know, Jared. I'm assuming. Are you sure they're not just giving CBD to a seal? You that know, might pe- be it. People give CBD products to dogs. Maybe they're giving, maybe they. From the seed yeah. to seal. If your seal is struggling with anxiety, joint pain, these CBD products from Bicken and Boone could help your seal. Try to make a seal noise for me. That's mine. That's, that's what I've got for you. In January 2020, cornbread hemp became the first brand from Kentucky to offer, offer USDA-certified organic CBD products. Cornbread Hemp was featured in November 2019's print edition of High Times Magazine, which is, uh, in 2019, Cornbread Mafia book author James Higdon co-founded Cornbread Hemp, which sells CBD products in retail outlets coast-to-coast and on their website. So a couple legitimate businesses have been born out of this uh, illegal enterprise. In May of 2020, Higdon was featured in a Q&A with Forbes contributor Warren Bobro, the Cocktail Whisperer. <laughs> and Cornbread Hemp nickname. products were featured in Whole Foods magazine. Oh, they made it all the way to Whole Foods. I've got a question. So Higdon wrote a book about the Cornbread Mafia? And then got involved with them in business. Well, that seems like, like a bit of a journalistic issue. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they read the book and they were like, that was incredible. Higdon, get over here. Do you think Higdon is a New York Times bestselling author like you? Maybe. Why are they doing CBD instead of just... Is Kentucky still an illegal state, I'm guessing? I want you to think about what you just said. It's Kentucky's an illegal state, right? Oh, and federally... It's illegal. Well, I'm, no, I'm just saying Kentucky has got to be one of the biggest. They, they're going to be one of the last. You're saying it's a red state. Yes. Like one, ours. One, I don't. It might be the most red state. It's redder than my ass after you spank it in wow. the backyard. Is marijuana legal in Kentucky? There's no way. It says no. <laughs> it says absolutely no way. No. Uh, what do you think the last state, Ross? <laughs> Here's the last headline, in fact. Bill to legalize medical marijuana in Kentucky appears dead. That's medical, yeah, not exactly. recreational. Yeah. Yeah. Medical marijuana. <laughs> it, we've even got some of that down here yeah. in Texas at this point. So I, I think if there was to be one final state to legalize, what do you think it would be? Like what will be the last state? It's going to be one of the, I mean, obviously most Southern Republican states. The one, whatever the population, the state whose population is the oldest per capita. So like, because those are the people who are not voting for weed. Old people. I'm thinking like Alabama. The old whites, in particular, are a problem when it comes to the marijuana. Alabama, Kentucky, Mississippi, Texas. Tennessee's got some liberal cities. Dude, we're up there, though. Even with Austin, which has got to be the pot capital of Texas, even with Austin, we're not even close. Like, the, 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 the weed that you can get medically in our state is some weak shit. Yeah, but we have Delta 8, which is, like, close enough. Yeah. Now, I guess. I, my take is that it's going to be made federally legal before before it'll states. be made state to state yes. for sure. But then you'll have these the reverse of what happened initially, where it's going to be like 
the states cracking down on pot instead of federal cracking down on pot, which is just going to get weird. That, that, that would is that possible? I don't. I think it doesn't federal supersede shit. I don't know, man. The states get to make their own decisions about certain yeah, stuff. Yeah, but not like abortion. Like if they, if the, if they were allowed to ban abortion, they would. Well, they're trying to now. But didn't we? Didn't Texas? They tried. What do you mean they tried? Well, the governor can put a fucking... He put it... The governor, Greg Abbott, your favorite, put a... Big fan. He made an executive order that said, the second that Roe v. Wade is overturned, then we're banning it. But he's Yeah, but he did set up some thing where you had like a... You could put like a $10,000 bounty on anybody you found out got an abortion or whatever. He did do that. Put a hit on them. He also said you should report your child if they're transgender or whatever. Yeah. He's not super... Progressive, he's not, or open-minded. He's not a lot of things. He's not a lot of things. That's that's a good way of putting it. That's my review of Greg Abbott. Not a lot of things, unfortunately. But yeah, there's our there's our 420 friendly pot segment for the day. You're welcome. Today's episode is brought to you by Felix Gray glasses. Five years ago, Felix Gray set out to create eyewear that would improve daily screen time, and since then, Felix Gray has been on a mission to create a better relationship with technology. Their lenses filter 15 times more blue light that can make screen time tough on eyes and disruptive to sleep. Obviously, I've been working on the internet for a long time now, over a decade, spending like 10 hours a day staring at screens, my phone, the computer, computer screens, the TV screens, and when I get home, done with work, I like to relax by watching my favorite shows and movies and gaming. All those things involve screens, too. So a couple few years ago when I was introduced to Felix Grey, everything changed. These glasses, the quality of designer frames, it's not some cheap blue light coating painted on them that's going to chip off. That never happens. No chipping, no cheapness. Just incredible quality designer frames that are stylish and functional as they protect your eyes from all the blue light that screens we rely upon emit. No cutting back on screen time if you're like me, but you can do your eyes a solid and get yourself some Felix Grays to get relief from those headaches, dry eyes, blurry vision, and what have you that occurs over the course of your workday. Jared and I both have a few pairs. I love the Faraday frames, the Nash, and the West. Go check out all their glasses on felixgrayglasses.com slash rbp to support the show and get free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges. They've got non-prescription and prescription available. Check them out now, felixgrayglasses.com slash rbp. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com slash rbp for free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges. All right, I have two insane headlines of the day for you. The first of which is a bombshell. An absolute bombshell. And I thought it was a joke when I first saw it. I didn't think it was real. That's how good it is. It's from today.com. Mom who popularized gender reveals regrets it now. Man, how many people are going to come forward and say that they regret the thing they invented that's destroying society? Like the text message guy. The like button guy. And now the gender reveal mom. From today.com, the woman credited with inventing gender reveal parties now says she regrets it because the mom of three says, quote, assigning focus on gender at birth leaves out so much of their potential and talents that have nothing to do with what's between their legs, end quote. So I totally thought she was going to regret it because of all the people who have died. The deaths, right? Maybe they get to that. Jenna and Nico Carvo... Carvunitis, Carvunitis experienced several pregnancy losses before they conceived their oldest daughter in 2008. They were so excited to finally reach the stage of pregnancy. When they were able to know the baby's sex, they decided to celebrate finding out with a party, complete with a cake in the shape of a duck that had a telling pink filling. And at the time, Jenna had no idea what the implications of that party would be for her family or for the world. Quote, I'm the type to bake a cake for every occasion. We like to party, she told Today Parents. I had absolutely no thoughts in 2008 of the greater implications of gender reveal parties. So obviously, now she is considering it's not just about the the danger presented by the explosive devices and and the incendiary objects. It's It's also the fact that gender, in and of itself, has become a much more... um, a, but a bigger focus in our society, right? With all the, the manner of pronouns that are, I guess, uh, that we've all been educated on at this point and, uh, and such. And it's obviously a highly controversial thing, as Jared and I just touched on what is occurring in our own home state of Texas, where uh, our governor and the, and the state government is, uh, is making some uh, waves in regard to trans children. Similarly, in your home state of Florida, that occurred as well. 
Uh, Los Angeles blogger wrote about her gender reveal party, which would be considered quaint and simple compared to the complex and elaborate productions of today, on her blog and in a parenting forum in July 2008. Then The Bump magazine interviewed her and featured the party in a story, and Carvenutis was credited with helping to popularize the gender reveal trend, a credit the mom of three now regrets. Uh, she said, gender reveal parties are canceled. I cringe when I see them now. The insane levels people are taking them just to celebrate one of the most mundane facts about their child is just bizarre. So she kind of talks about the explosions and deaths. A little bit. Uh, a post of her blog's uh, Facebook page, Carvenutis, reflected on how her perspective on gender reveals has changed in the past decade. Quote, who cares what gender the baby is, she wrote. I did at the time because we didn't live in 2019 and didn't know what we know now. So this story is back from 2019. That's how long she's been regretting this. Um, the assigned focus on gender at birth leaves out so much of their potential and talents that have nothing to do with what's between their legs. Uh, the post went viral, shared many, many tens of thousands of times at this point. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm in shock because even in the few years since she has had her revelation that she should not have invented the gender reveal party, there have been scores of deaths and all manner of limbs lost at the party that she invented. It's a goddamn shame. You got to be careful what you invent. That's the lesson. And you got to be careful with the theme of your party, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I think uh, it, it's just like the idea of, hey, here's our baby's gender. Here's a large bomb right. made by amateurs. Right, yeah. I don't, I don't know, that, I don't how know how, those, how they happening? came together. How is it still happening? How those two things and came together? How did the leap go from her party with a nice, cute, pink-filled duck to a cannonball killing a man? I, that's what's. That's the crazy thing is we took what was supposed to be a simple thing. You get a cake, you cut the cake, you look at the color on the inside of the cake, and you walk away. To full-blown, like... Refrigerators filled with tannerite being shot with high-powered sniper rifles at distance to explode in a blaze of glory that turns blue or pink. It's fucking insane. It's just ridiculous. I mean, we're spending whole half days on this shit. <laughs> the humans. People are taking off work. Taking off work, getting boozed up, and blowing stuff up. All in the name of finding out what color is going to pop out of something. The, what, what, what gender... The now fatherless baby <laughs> right, is going to be. <laughs> You're losing at least one parent at 20% of gender reveal parties, right? Yeah. The math is just horrible at this point. And uh, yeah, so Carvenutis should regret it. But it's good to know who's responsible for all these deaths that we report on. Yeah, she, shouldn't, she shouldn't have uh, come out and claimed it. Now she's got blood in her hands. Yep. That's tough. You can't, you can't wash that blood off, Jerry. That stains forever. The blood of a gender reveal party never washes away. Our next story is that John Daly's son, who has played one college golf team tournament, signs NIL deal with Hooters. You remember NIL, right? Yeah. The college kids are allowed to sign endorsement deals now with brands, and this is the, the most, you know, obvious one that I've heard yet. Of course, John Daly's kid is going to sign with Hooters. Here's the story from Golf Week. John Daly the second. They call him Little John. They na He named his fucking... I'm just like, if you're a degenerate... And you know it like John Daly knows it, dude. Like he wakes up, walks out of his RV, and lights a cigarette with a drink in his hand, right? Like that's a degenerate. This man gambles $50,000 a pull on a slot machine. That's a degenerate. You can't pass your name down to the kid. Mostly because it's just going to make it really easy for the creditors to find your kid once you die and you're like $5 million in debt. Yeah, and just like his Google is fucked. Right? Like, his, like you can never... Go John Daly the second's name is ungoogleable forever. I do like that they call him Little John Daly. Like, that is a tight name. Uh, it's kind of dope. Little John is one of the coolest nicknames you could possibly have. Anyway, he's played John Daly the second in one tournament for the University of Arkansas, which is also where his father went to school, and also the only college campus outside of Texas that I've ever visited. Loved it in Fayetteville. Beautiful. Um, I was dating a girl there at the time. I wasn't just, like, wandering the country. Are there? Is aimlessly. it, like, in the Ozark Mountains... Kind of. Fayetteville? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's mountains. There's, it's mountainous. People say, and I'm sure we have some Arkansas listeners right now, but people say Arkansas is one of the most underratedly beautiful states. I agree with that statement. As somebody who went to uh, camp there at Camp Ozark in the Ozark Mountains, um, it was gorgeous, man. It really is something else. And Fayetteville just in and of itself is, it's got to be like a top 20 college town. It's got to be. There's just, I have a hard time believing there's 20 little quaint, beautiful college towns like that around. But 
You know? they, they had uh, Brett Bielema as their coach for a while. Noted they did. Former Wisconsin coach. Noted strange name to say. Makes you feel funny. Brett Bielema. Bielema. Double Bs. Remember, my favorite gif of all time. <laughs> Brett Bielema. You know how there'll be like a large procession and like parade? Like there'll be like barriers up outside the stadium for fans to stand at as the players walk in and you, you clap for them. They high five you as they walk into the stadium. Now there's a famous video and GIF. Brett Bielema was doing this walk at Arkansas. Yeah. And at one point he, f- he, he fell down. He tripped. However, nobody has ever tripped the way Brett Bielema tripped. He, he, the way he fell, it's like he got shot by a sniper. Oh yeah. He, he, he got, he fell to his knees first. He's walking. <laughs> he falls to both knees at the same time and then falls on his stomach. And people, people made gifs of like the sniper from Saving Private Ryan going like yeah. talking in German and then shooting I and it just cuts this. to Brett no, he's Bielema. praying. He's doing the prayer. Oh, the he's prayer, doing yeah, the prayer yeah, yeah. and then he takes out Brett Bielema. <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing that shit. Yeah, it's like the scene in uh, in uh, uh, Tropic Thunder where Ben Stiller is making fun of the other the actual Vietnam movie and he's getting shot like 400 times on his knees doing this. Love that shit. Anyway, John Daly's kid uh, posted one round under par during his only event played so far, but that did not stop him from signing a name, image, and likeness deal with Hooters, an agreement that was announced on Tuesday. The statements are phenomenal here. Here's the one from uh, the senior Daly, John Daly, that we all know and love. Can't express how excited I am to be back with my Hooters family and having my son behind, beside me on the next generation. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, it says, uh, what's, what, what the fuck? Where's his? Oh, yeah. The kid also had a quote, but here's the terms of the deal were not disclosed. Quote, Hooters is thrilled to make our longstanding relationship with John official and to enter an exciting new venture with Little John as our first NIL's ambassador. Hooters senior VP of marketing said in a release, John's larger than life personality makes him an ideal representation of Hooters fun loving spirit with Little John. Uh, while Little John will promote our brand to the next generation as one of the next big names in golf, we are ecstatic to have the Dailies, fantastic golfers and great personalities on board as spokespeople for Hooters, the definitive 19th hole. I told you the story. My brother and dad were playing golf uh, in Clearwater, Florida, and they, and they hear some some jackass blasting fucking music from a Bluetooth speaker on the golf cart, and they turn around and it's just John and Little John yep. on, a, on a public course. <laughs> Yeah, they don't give a fuck. They really, really, really don't give a fuck. But I love this for the kid. It's great stuff. I'm trying to find his tweet. But, oh, yeah, so in the announcement, my favorite part of this is that the pictures they've put up to be like, John Daly, John Daly the second, Hooters. It's just those two goofballs on a golf course with two Hooters chicks. And John Daly the second is one of the funniest looking human beings that currently walks the face of the earth because he looks like John Daly in the face, but then with not a giant John Daly body. And he dresses like absolute shit. So, congratulations to Hooters. He's the next big thing in golf. Yeah, and that's the other side of this, is that like we all know there's like a, you know, 1% chance that John Daly the second actually ends up being... A noteworthy golfer, right? Well, he's he's famous because, you know, the in the tournament where you play with your son, because, you know, Charlie Woods and Tiger Woods play together and they steal a lot of headlines. Yeah, yeah. But they didn't really have a chance because Charlie Woods is like 12, whereas Little John, they might have actually won that because he, he's a good golfer. Yeah, he's a legitimate Arkansas, University of Arkansas golfer. It's just like he's only played one fucking college tournament yeah. so far, so you have no idea yes. what his career is going to look like when it's all said and done. It is obviously a branding play that is mostly based on their already existing relationship with his father. And as I've mentioned several times, one of the funniest things about when I got to go to the Masters in 2017, some of you may have heard, uh, was that in Augusta, Georgia, where there is literally not much going, man. It's a very small town and it is not like Fayetteville. It is just basically empty unless the Masters is going on. One of the only things they have in that town is a Hooters. And when I got to go to Augusta um, and went to the Hooters, it turns out John Daly legitimately parks his RV right outside the Hooters, and that's where he lives all of Masters Week. And we waited outside of his RV in the morning, and legitimately he stumbles out at like 10 a.m., lights a cigarette, he's got a booze drink in his hand, and there's like a table out in front of him, and his people come out, like his wife sla- or his girl slash manager who's got, you know, the size breasts you would think. She she starts set they're setting up all the autograph stuff on the table and shit. And then he just sits down and he chain smokes all day and sells $5 a pop autographs to people. And that's John Daly's fucking life now. 
and it is something else. He hangs hard at Hooters. He also almost died. What? He almost died, like, a few years back. And then after he got out of the hospital, he immediately went to a bar and did a knocking on Heaven's Door karaoke. And the video went viral. Didn't his wife, like, knife him? His ex-wife? <laughs> Uh, maybe potentially allegedly. I've never heard about this. John Daly ex-wife knife. I'm pretty positive. I'm gonna start saying potentially allegedly for, th- yeah, for things sh- that might be alleged. He accused her of trying to stab him with a steak knife. So, at a Hooters? I don't think so. Just at home. Does Hooters have steak? Surely. Like that seems like the kind of place you go to get a sirloin. Hooters? Yeah. I don't know if they have steak, man. They gotta have sirloin. They're known for the wings. You're telling me Hooters doesn't have a sirloin? No, I'm not telling you anything. I don't fucking know. It's the Hooters menu. I don't go to Hooters. I've talked many times. I'm not a restaurant guy. I do not like mixing sexuality and food. I'm the opposite of George Costanza. Do you have a steak tier list? Let's see, dessert. I'm on your other question, man. I'm trying to find out if they got fucking steak now. I got the menu pulled up and shit. Why don't you do something? Be productive over there. Uh, God damn, you don't, you don't have a computer in front of you. You're worthless. I've got a phone. You're worthless. You can play ringtones. Appetizers, wings, burgers, sandwiches, and tacos, seafood, salads, fries, and I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no and walk away. But can you get a steak added onto your salad? Walked away, Jared. It's too late. Come Closed on. it. Come Closed on. it. I don't think they have steak at Hooters, bro. I think you're shit out of luck here. You're gonna need to go to a Twin Peaks. Get yourself a sirloin. Do they have roast beef at Hooters? <laughs> anyway, congratulations to John Daly the second, and uh, hopefully he'll grow into his head a little more. It's just it's a giant John Daly bobblehead on top of a child's body and it freaks me out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Talkspace. It's spring cleaning season. Time to get out the old and make room for the new. Right, J-Bone? There's oh, yeah. something rejuvenating about getting down to what's essential and starting fresh and the same goes with your mind. Over the years thoughts and emotions can build up and that's why it's important to talk to someone who's trained to help you declutter your mental space. Talkspace therapists are available to message anytime you need because you shouldn't have to watch your thoughts pile up until your next appointment rolls around. I love therapy. I've been in it for 10 years. Uh, it's been a pivotal piece of my my life and, and, and keeping everything on track. But it can be annoying because every once in a while you'll have like a life situation come up where you're like, ah, my, my next appointment isn't for two weeks. Therapists are often, you know, very fully booked and unavailable. Uh, and that can suck. And talk space, obviously erases that problem. Taking the first step towards getting help can be scary, but no matter where you are in your mental health journey, talking to a therapist who's trained to help makes a huge difference, and Talkspace takes some of the pressure off that first step. It's a more flexible, convenient, and affordable way to get high-quality care. Once you match with one of their licensed therapists, you can message them anytime through the app or schedule a live session if you need some FaceTime. If thoughts and emotions are piling up, a fresh perspective can help you feel much better. Match with your dedicated therapist today at Talkspace.com. Use promo code RBP during sign-up to get one hundred dollars off your first month great deal rbp gang that is one hundred dollars off at talkspace.com promo code rbp and now ross boland's animal of the week love it you're the dog j-bone time for another dog we got to learn about one of the most famous dogs in history, one that I didn't know about. It's Bobby the Wonder Dog. Okay. Bobby the Wonder Dog, spelled B-O-B-B-I-E, which I do not like. Uh, wow, that's what my grandma's name is. I'm sorry. I'm a Y guy. But, th- okay, this makes sense, though. It's a Kali Shepherd mix. Kali is I-E. You got to go Bobby the Kali, right? Many of his include, uh, this. I'm just going to read you the story. Many of his include our pups with us on trips. This was the case, too, for the Braziers when they drove, it's an interesting last name, from Silverton, Oregon to Walcott, Indiana to visit a family, to visit family with their two young daughters and family pet Bobby, a Scotch Collie and English Shepherd mix. <coughs> so Bobby gets into a scuffle with a couple stray dogs and takes off. And the Braziers have to go home to Oregon. They can't find their freaking dog. They leave behind instructions should the pup turn up. But they unfortunately go home believing they're never going to see their family dog again. I'm getting major homeward bound vibes already from this story. Okay, six months pass, dude. (laughs) Six months. A half a fucking calendar year. And Bobby turns up scratching and pawing at their owner's front door. And what they find out is Bobby crossed over 2,500 miles in cold winter to be reunited with the family. And the story becomes national news in a matter of weeks. Bobby's in the spotlight. And then 
people start coming out and saying like, holy shit, I fucking saw that dog wandering in the street. It was all fucked up. I took it inside and fed it and like took care of it for a couple weeks. And then when it was all healed up, it went on its way. And all these different people had like helped this dog make its journey 25,000 miles, however many miles I said. Who takes in a dog? 2,500 miles. Feeds it, cares for it, and then goes, all right, see you later. It's like that, remember in Kung Fu Hustle when the baby's coming down the river and she picks the baby out of the river from its cradle and goes, oh, so cute. Puts it back in the cradle, pushes it back down the river and goes, bye-bye. No, but that's hilarious. <laughs> it's the opposite of what happens in the Prince of Egypt. Yeah, it is. But yeah, it's, it's pretty wild, man. I mean, and, you know, to the story's credit, when I'm in my neighborhood and I see a dog wandering in the street off its leash, I usually stop to at least try to get the dog to stop with me and wait to see if somebody's around. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole day on the whatever, but like example, recently I was driving into work and our neighbor has a little chihuahua that they leave outside all the time, but I didn't really know this yet and it was chilling too close to the street, so I got out to try to help the dog and then eventually it's people came out and they were like, no, it's, it, this is where it stays. And I Wait, was like, is, Oh, is that the one in your neighborhood? Yeah, bro. I drive by that dog all the time. And, and it's I'm, outside. I'm all day, so every day. scared. I'm going to run over. It. It's in the fucking street for 20 hours a day. All day, every day. I fucking hate that dog. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> and it's a chihuahua. So it's like oh, small it's and squirrel fat. size. It's so fat. That little chihuahua though, for sure. Dude, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of pissed at that dog's owner. Somebody's going to hit that fucking dog. Yeah. It's, and if it's, it's me, I'm going to be so sad. Dude, I've been here like four years now and it still hasn't happened. It's, it's some kind of miracle, but that dog just knows like the squirrels do. So or some of the squirrels. Here's the issue I have. When I'll drive by that dog and I know to look for it and somebody will be driving toward me and it'll be kind of the thing where there's a car on the other side of the road. So they're going to need to go onto the left side of the road to get around that car. And I'm like, do I fucking flash my lights at them or wave at them to be like, hey, fucking dog in the road, fucking dog. No. <laughs> you don't. Because then part of me goes, well, oh, they're going to be like looking in their rear view at me going, what the fuck is that just, jackass just worry, doing? Just worry about you, dickhead. Okay. Just worry about you. Okay. Why are you so worried about everybody else? It's, don't You just don't run over the dog. That's your responsibility. Uh, okay, so back to Bobby the Wonder Dog. It, uh, it survives. It comes home. Uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah. So, Stardom brings even more stories, many from people who claim to help him along his journey, feeding him scraps, giving him water, or tending to his scraped-up paws. He gained so much attention that in 1924, Bobby even starred in a silent film. Wow. In 1927, Bobby was buried at the pet cemetery ran by the Oregon Humane Society. Today, this is one of the most famous dogs in history that we know of. Tourists from all over the world can visit its grave, as well as view a 70-foot mural honoring his journey in downtown Silverton, the home he traveled so many miles to return to. They may have gone a little bit overboard with a 70-foot mural. That's seven stories tall. 70 feet for Bobby the Wonder Dog, Jared. And I've never even heard of this city. This might be the, the tallest building in the city. This is It has on. to be. It's Silverton. It's a, it's like that. It's like Bobby the Wonder Dog is now the god of that city. If he's just a seventy foot mural looking over the city, it was too big, wild as hell. Upon his death in nineteen twenty seven, he was buried with honors at that pet cemetery. And a week later, German Shepherd film star Rin Tin Tin laid a wreath at Bobby the Wonder Dog's grave. This is the most nineteen twenty shit I've ever heard in my life. His grave is sheltered <laughs> by a quote fancy white and red doghouse was received during a promotional appearance at the Portland Home Show. The gravestone has now been moved outside the house for better viewing. Wild. 2,500 miles, man. Bruce and Bella would have absolutely 0.0% chance of pulling that shit off. There's no way. They're not making it a half mile. They're not making it a one house over. One block. It's not happening. Yeah, 2,500 miles, man. Bobby the Wonder Dog. 70-foot mural. God of Silverton. Pretty wild. Today's episode is also brought to you by Manscaped. Have you started spring cleaning yet? The carpets need cleaning, the drapes need dusting, and your lawn needs mowing. Spring has sprung, and the global leaders in below-the-waist grooming have the best tools for cleaning aisle five in your pants. Time to clear out of your winter bush and join the other four million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping when you use the code RBP. Manscaped has the full package you need for spring cleaning this year, the Performance Package 4.0. You just get that, and you'll have everything you need to get your boys looking and smelling like the fresh tulips your partner wants. To start your spring cleaning, use the Manscaped Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, which comes in that package, to get the most precise shave on your hedges. It's waterproof as well. No need to worry about watering your grass with this tool. Equipped with an LED light, so you know it'll be a major asset to the new shower routine. 
You can clean your holes and smell the spring air with the Weed Whacker. And not that hole, Jared. It's for your ears and your nose. Your nose and ear hair trimmer with proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps prevent nick snags and tugs in those delicate holes. After clearing out your nose and ears, make sure you get rid of that foul ball smell that you have, Jared, with your, your disgustingly smelly testicles by using the Crop Preserver and Crop Reviver. The Preserver is an anti-chafing ball deodorant and moisturizer. The Reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls, keeping your balls nice and toned and from sticking to your leg and, and makes them smell like fresh flowers. And you can finish off your grooming routine with the Plow four point, or the 2.0. It's a perfect razor for your f- the finest shave on your face because if you're using your lawnmower 4.0 on your balls and your face, you are doing it incorrectly. The Plow 2.0, that's the one for your face. And the lawnmower 4.0 is for your downstairs mix-up, Jared. Don't get it confused. I won't. 20% off plus free shipping. Use the code RBP at manscaped.com. 20% off plus free shipping when we, uh, you let them know we sent you by putting in code RBP when you check out at manscaped.com. It's time to throw out your old hygiene habits and upgrade your life with Manscaped today. Jared, you may have heard Netflix. The uh, original mammoth streaming platform has experienced some serious issues over the past week or so. Their stock has plummeted like a historical amount. From C- CNBC, shares of Netflix closed down more than 35% Wednesday, yesterday, after the streamer reported earnings Tuesday evening that showed it lost subscribers for the first time in more than 10 years. So they had a quarter for the first time in a decade where they lost subscribers, right? And that is obviously not good. Uh, The results and weak outlook led to a wave of downgrades from Wall Street on fears over the company's long-term growth potential. And the drop caused Netflix to shave more than $50 billion off their market cap. It is now the worst performing stock of 2022 in the S&P 500, down 62.5% year to date. Uh, Netflix said several headwinds are affecting growth, including increasing competition, obvious, and the lifting of pandemic restrictions, Obvious. So Netflix has a vested interest in keeping COVID going for as long as possible. It's an interesting thought, Jared. It's something to watch out for. It is. And the video streamer's business benefited from coronavirus stay-at-home orders with more people seeking out digital entertainment. But in recent months, most people have been spending time uh, less time on digital platforms as vaccines rolled out and mandates eased. The biggest piece of this puzzle, and the reason I wanted to talk about it today, is that Netflix is now estimating that 100 million households are, are sharing passwords, and that is obviously resulting in the loss of billions of dollars in revenue. Uh-huh. And uh, the funny thing about that is that we've all known that was the problem for since day one. Literally since the first time Netflix made it possible for you to even log in multiple places, this has been an issue that we all, the general public, I think assumed they either didn't give a shit or wasn't mattering, or that eventually they would solve it. Like, I always figured they would find a way, IP limitation or something, to get it, you know, where you couldn't just have people logged in all over the country into the same fucking account. Because that's what ends up happening, right? You got, like, your kid goes to college, they use the same account. You know how many people I I know that are in their late 20s, early 30s that are still using their parents' like cable subscription or Netflix subscription or HBO Max subscription? I mean, the sharing thing was a massive problem. For the streaming industry from day one, and I can't believe they just now are looking into a way to solve this as they are, their company is being threatened and <laughs> their stock is plummeting. Uh, my theory is that they it's, it's a long play for them. I, th- I think their whole plan was to get people going, oh, I fucking love Netflix. I'm a Netflix person. I watch Netflix all the time. So when they finally go, nope, only one login at a time. Then, then their number of subscribers shoots to the roof. That's what you would think, right? Now, the the problem I think they didn't anticipate is that so many other streaming platforms would find success. That's true. Because initially, honestly, I was one of those people that was like, look, nobody's going beyond Netflix, Amazon Prime, maybe one other. HBO. Right, HBO. That was wrong. Now, there's, I mean, a lot of the people I know have five, six, seven different streaming platforms, the Peacocks. Paramount the Plus. Paramount Pluses and the and the Hulus. And the, I mean, there are a lot of, and the thing is, the more the, the years have gone by, a lot of those platforms, Apple TV Plus, Disney Plus, they've started to produce actually award-winning level uh, movies and TV shows, right? I think uh, Coda that received Best Picture at the Academy Awards a couple weeks ago was an Apple TV Plus deal. And uh, that is the problem. I think they anticipated, well, eventually when we have to cut off the password thing, all of our subscriber numbers will just shoot up. Yeah, but think about it. What's the must-watch Netflix thing? 
I mean, the most recent one was what? Like Queen's Gambit? The Ultimatum. They would have to have the they would have to have the a Queen's Gambit level success every season. Yeah. In in order to be able to maintain that that, you know, the line of thought that, oh yeah, all these subscribers will just go up when we turn off the passwords. Because now I think people are hearing the news. They've already, you know, either never had a Netflix subscription because they've been using somebody else's or whatever, um, and they're looking at their current subscriber list, their list of all the different streaming platforms they're subscribed to, and it's like, ah, I don't need Netflix. I there's, Netflix doesn't have that much for me right now. I mean... I've already watched all the nice documentaries. I would argue that the, the two biggest things for a streaming platform, number one, original content, right? Original content like you really got to draw people in with something that's like the talk i ate one of the talked about shows right and number two the movie catalog that you provide right the backlog of movies and new movies that you have access to drop like hbo max dropping batman is a big win for them that's a big win a lot of people get drawn in to watch it now instead of going to the theater or whatever um but even more importantly than the new movies hitting the platforms, like the backlog of old movies that they have is, is the thing that makes a platform most enticing to me. Their original programming plus their backlog. I just don't watch movies, so for me it's just original just programming. Just the original programming. Or, in or in like, which case, it gets really tough for Netflix to make that sell because of what we're talking about. They haven't had like a whole bunch of must-watch stuff. They no. do have some stuff, but not a lot. Not enough. I would say, Obviously not enough to keep their subscriber numbers up. Drive to Survive for me. Another one? That's, Drive to Survive? That's a big one. Yeah, I mean, look, to, you, you only need that for a week a year. It's just back in the day, you know, even five years ago, I would argue, the thought was, oh, yeah, I'll have Netflix forever. That's not really the way I feel anymore. I'm like, yeah, I could see Netflix falling off. Now, me being in media, that's likely not going to happen. But I definitely feel how a lot of people no longer see Netflix as a must have absolutely necessary thing, especially think about this. You know, people are struggling, pandemic life is hard, work, whatever. A lot of those people are Marvel people. And if you're picking a platform and you only can pick a couple, like Disney Plus is going to get your business as a Marvel fan. Now, there are other examples like that where these built-in fan bases are automatically going to go to X platform because of their offering. And then Netflix is just another player in the game at that point. They're no longer an essential. So crazy to me that they're just now realizing how fucked the password sharing thing is uh, because it's too late to fix. Like, I don't know how they think they're going to maneuver here, but they're not going to get all the subscriptions they think they are out of that. If they get a bunch of subscriptions, it it's at the cost of people hating them. Yeah, which is the thing they always wanted to avoid, I assume. Anyway, fucking crazy. Speaking of annoying technology stuff, I am getting 10 spam calls a day again. It is... It's just ridiculous. And like really the spam texting has increased over the course of the pandemic more and more over the past several months even. And I just, I want, at this point, I want to know how much money is lost in the American economy to text and phone fraud annually, because I bet it is a staggering number. Uh -huh. You know how many times a day I come close to clicking on one of those stupid fucking links in the tech? It's like, click here to track your Amazon package and my brain barely gets to, hey, idiot, you didn't order anything from Amazon right as my finger is about to press the blue link. And if you press the blue link, I don't know what happens. I don't either. It I don't want to know. It's not good. I know it's not good. I kind of want to know what happens now. If you've ever pressed the blue link yeah. in any of those spam texts, let us know what happened. Yeah, if you're one of the idiots over the years that I've gotten a DM from you on Instagram that said like, hey, I've got something to show you. <laughs> Uh, tell me what happened. How did that, how did you get to that place? Because yeah. I, I imagine it involved a blue link and I, I don't want to go to there. My brain, here's what my brain says. It, my brain says, I fucking touched that blue link. Everything I fucking is gone. is gone. That's what my brain tells me. My brain tells me if you click on that blue link, it's, it's everything. Your, your, you, your identity is, it just, just disappears. I'm going to come home and there's going to be somebody banging my, my wife. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> it's just some other dude. Name's not even Jared. Seriously, that's it's, what I feel like will happen. It's that guy with the fucking dog. I'm going to come out. There's going to be two dogs in my front yard, and this guy's going to be <laughs> banging my wife. Bing bong. Yeah, that's not what you want, man, and that's what happens if you click on those blue links. Uh, they take Your bank account is empty next time you check it. Your wife is getting boned out by some other dude that looks a little bit like you with a different name, and, and you just, you just, you're done. It's over. You got to go start over. That's it. You start over. 
Might as well go into the wild for a couple weeks and then come back out and just new, whole new identity, man. Bing bong. Because that's the only option you've got at this point because you clicked the blue link. Never click the blue link. Never answer the spam call. N- no, look, I don't know how many times Fortnite and your bank and Cash App and Venmo have to send you the message. We will never ask for your personal information for any fucking reason through email or text message. They say that. Every one of them says it. Because they have to, because jackasses are scamming on every platform. Pay attention to that. They will never ask you. So if somebody calls you and says, I need your whatever number. No, fuck that. Fuck that. You go look them in the eye at the bank or whatever, you know? Don't trust text. Don't trust email. Don't trust phone calls. I don't know how many times we have to say it, but it's still a huge problem. And it just, it makes me suspicious when like I'm getting blown up and I consider myself to be a relatively smart person when it comes to technology and such. And I'm still coming close to clicking on it because I can feel the draw because I just want to know. And some days I'm like, maybe I should click the blue link and just start over. If I don't have Wipe your, the slate. If I don't have your phone number in my phone, you're not getting your call answered. It could be the cops telling me that my house burned down and I'm like, I'm sorry, you're going to go to voicemail. Yeah, there's like six people's names who I, I recognize that I'm answering the phone for. And that's it. Anybody else, you're going to voicemail. And if you leave a voicemail... I might not even listen to it. Sometimes I just go, I click over to the voicemail thing and it's like one minute and 46 seconds and I just delete it. Move on with my life. That is not a fair and effective way to communicate. You're giving me anxiety, man. If you I was, leaves voicemails, yeah. the fucking police. If I was unemployed like I was for much of the last few years, it would be bad because it'd be like people calling to follow up on my application and I'm like, nah. You got to answer every number. One of them you're giving your bank account info to. Yeah. <laughs> right? Hey, we're hiring you on the spot. We want a direct deposit. Yep. <laughs> What See you- how believable that could be, though? I mean, that's the thing about the scam artists is, like, this is the laziest fucking job. It's so easy. You just That's it? You just lie? That's the whole Ooh. job? Okay. N- now, Reply All has gotten to be total trash, sadly. However. The podcast? Yeah. But one of the greatest podcasts of all time is where Reply All, they go down this whole rabbit hole of this scam caller from India, and they travel to India and meet with him and go th- and it's one of the best Audio investigative journalist pieces ever. Look it up uh, on Reply All. It's called like Scam Caller or something. See, whenever I think about those stories like that, and I'm like, man, we could do something like that. And then I think about like the actual act of having to go to India and and track that person down. And I'm like, nah, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I mean, I get it. I'm good for them. And that's we need journalists like that. We need those people out there doing their jobs because it's not me. I can't do it. I just sit here and make jokes with you. India? India. Was he like well off? Was he crushing no. it? No. No? No. Dude, how? Well, he worked for he worked for somebody and the person he worked for, I think he was slightly scared of them. Oh, so it's like a, a, a hardcore illegal enterprise. Mm-hmm. Ah, fun, fun. So if it makes you feel any better, unless it's like a homegrown scammer, like the person scamming you probably is, is not- uh, Living their best life. Yes. Yeah. 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 Prison of their own creation. Yeah, be like that. Sometimes. Anyway, hit bowlandmedia.com slash shop to grab yourself some RBP merch, some Formula Bone merch, some Bone Zone merch, some Oysters, Clams, and Cockles merch. Support Bowling Media. Grab yourself a hat, a t-shirt, a mouse pad, a coffee mug, all kinds of good stuff and new items being added pretty regularly to our merch shop on bowlandmedia.com slash shop where if you are a member of our Patreon page, you get a 10% off code with which to use on your next order. Patreon.com slash Ross Boland Podcast is where Jared and I release a third ad-free premium episode each and every week for our listenership to enjoy in exchange for their support. It's a minimum pledge of $5 monthly on Patreon.com slash Ross Boland Podcast to support the show. In exchange, you will get Mo, including Friday episodes that do not have ads in them and are even more unhinged than our normal Free episodes that are on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Jared and I have a blast every week on Patreon. We'd love for you to come through and support the podcast and support Bolin Media in exchange for an additional episode of the Ross Bolin Podcast every week. It's the same length of these, as these other episodes. And uh, yeah, get in there today. If you've never done it, you gain access to our entire backlog the second you log in. So you'll get hundreds of episodes from our past on Patreon that you could listen to immediately. I'll show you a backlog. Wow. Follow us on social media. We're on TikTok where we're currently crushing it. Or at least we were. I think we hit another 
flag they flagged us somehow. So well, they flagged us because we put up a clip that actually did well, and then and then and this, then they noticed it, and then they noticed it. <laughs> it's the one about uh, about Jesus. Yeah, they didn't. Nutting. I thought the Chinese were anti Christianity. I, th- I thought they were. A- I thought they would be secular. They or would whatever. be cool with our with our with our religious jokes, but they're not cool with it. I recommend everybody listening right now. If you are a TikToker, go yeah. to TikTok, go to the RP page at the look, Ross Boland podcast. Look at how our video has been performing before that video. And then after. Look at that video and then look after. It's like all the ones after it are like 5,000 views. All the ones before it are like 70,000 views. 200,000. Yeah, it's like it, it really. Uh, we got fucked. And it's funny because just as an aside, a little social media aside, several months ago when Jared and I were first getting into TikTok and realized like that was the next avenue we were going to destroy, and we have, um, in particular Jared with Formula Bone, which is over 120,000 followers already, it, uh, it used to be that, like, pretty regularly on the RBP account, we were getting actual flags. Like, it would flag our yes. content, pull it down, and tell us, like, you can't post for two, three days, or two weeks in some cases, or whatever. <laughs> and then now, they've changed it up to where if you post something they don't like, it's it's a shadow ban, like Instagram does. Where if you post stuff they don't like, I mean, I've seen people get, like, sub- subdued for a month based on shit they post, right? Where everything they put up for weeks was getting no views on Instagram because of Zuckerberg's uh, suppression tactics. So it appears that's what they're doing on TikTok now. Just FYI, be careful if you're a TikToker out there. Yeah, maybe we shouldn't talk about Jesus nutting. No jokes about Jesus uh, experiencing orgasm on the TikTok. They just don't like sex shit at all. That's that's what what we'd always get taken down for back in the day. I don't think it had anything to do with Jesus, being honest. I think it's just the sexual jokes they do not like. Ross would be like, suck me dry, and then we get a six-day ban. Yeah. Somebody, Which oh. Couldn't I, even make a, a single boner reference. And then, and then you got this one. Somebody suck me. All time. All time. But yeah, patreon.com slash Ross Boland podcast uh, for more episodes. And at the Ross Boland podcast on TikTok to see our TikToks. We're also on Instagram. And we are at Ross Boland pod on Twitter. Follow Mr. Borislow at Jared Borislow on Instagram and Twitter and me at WR Bolin on Instagram and Twitter. Of course, listen to the Formula Bone F1 show. New episode out now, Jared. Tell the people shortly what it's about. Well, the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix is this weekend, Ross. It's also known as Imola. Hmm. It's a more common name. Imola. I preview Imola via the Formula Bone F1 show. It's phenomenal. Everybody's saying they've learned everything they've ever it's learned about best. Imola from Everyone my knows podcast. the very best. Check it out on YouTube. It's where it's, you know, it's, it's where if it's you want to watch your videos. It's where it's hot. It's where it's hot. The YouTube streets. Because I'm in it. My face is in it. It's hot as fuck. Yep. Almost pornographic. YouTube.com slash Formula Bone to watch the latest Formula Bone F1 show from Jared Borslow previewing Imola. Imola. Coming up this weekend. By the way, speaking of TikTok, Ross, hmm. after we're done recording, stay seated. Because I have a great idea for a TikTok story, which if you're listening right now and want to see it, go to our TikTok. At the Ross Bolin Podcast on TikTok. Jared and I will be back on Friday with another episode exclusively on Patreon for our supporters in the RBP gang, enforcers, and OGs. Until next time, peace be with you and also with you.